Hey, good morning, Sage Hills Church. How are you today? Yeah, good to see you guys here today. Glad you're with us. I missed you guys last week, uh, but if you're a guest, we're glad you're here. I love the chance to get to know you uh, right outside these doors. We have our foyer, and we have a connection center, and we have our, my friend Cassidy's over there today. She'd love the chance to talk to you and help you get connected here. Uh, last week, like I said, I was away on a prayer retreat. I went up to uh, North Carolina, and uh, I was at a place called Moravian Falls, and I was in this um, this uh, cabin, and I prayed and uh, had a great time uh, visiting a couple churches while I was there, seeking the Lord, and uh, really did uh, have exactly what I needed from the Lord, and that was to be filled up by Him and His presence. And so uh, grateful that our team held it down while we're gone and excited to uh, be wrapping up our series Upside Down uh, this morning. Uh, we are wrapping that up, and I'm uh, thrilled to share with you that next week, starting that new conversation, Filled or Famished, it's on the life of Jacob. Uh, you're not going to want to miss a week of that. Invite some friends out to experience it. It's going to be a wonderful time in the Lord. Uh, That'll be great. But today, wrapping up the greatest sermon ever preached. Not the one that I'm about to preach, although I think it's going to be pretty good. But the greatest sermon ever preached was the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but it is the largest recorded discourse of Jesus. It's his largest uh, section of talking that he did his entire time on earth. More importantly, the largest conversation that he had with a group of people uh, in his three years of ministry uh, recorded in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 5 through 7. Uh, it, it's, it's an incredible thing, and we haven't had the time to go through all of it, um, but I want to encourage you, if you have the chance, or even if you don't have the chance, make the chance and read Matthew 5 through 7 so you can get the full context of what we've shared about. We've spent the majority of our time in Matthew chapter 5, uh, but we thought about how, how we should end this thing. And so today, what I want to talk to you about is something that none of of you have ever had a problem with. None of you have ever struggled with this thing. And so, and then that's why I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it because it's so incredibly irrelevant to what we're dealing with in life today. And that's what I want our church to be about. I want our church to spend 35 minutes every week in talking about things that you'll never need to hear. That's why we came to church. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know I'm about to joke, right? <laughs> yeah. Matthew chapter 6 towards the end, talks about this subject of these things. Jesus talks about these things. Turn to your neighbor and say, these things. Yeah, and what Jesus talks about in regard to these things uh, are pretty interesting, but like I said, probably not applicable to you. You just listen, and as you listen, if it's for you, grab hold of it, but it's probably not. But my heart and hope for you today is that your eyes are open and ears are attentive to the Word of God, and I'd ask that you would stand out of reverence for reading of God's Word this morning. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It's a familiar verse. It's a familiar verse. But let's just see how we're doing living this thing out. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all what? Will be given to you as well. Let's read that together, and let's all read it, because we'll just keep trying until we all do it. 100% participation, or at least 98, is what we're going for. Ready? Read. Just out of curiosity, um, what place does Jesus want himself to be seeked? Yeah, not a trick question, church. Everybody say first. first. Yeah, first. And, you know, when he said in all of these, what, these Like, these things that Jesus is referring to, they're actually quite important things. Like, a matter of fact, most of us, when we think about these things, say these things, when we think about these things, we, we, what we really recognize is that these things are actually what our life revolves around. But Jesus is making a, an earth-shattering statement here. Life that revolves around these things does not produce righteousness. He said the moment that you choose to seek who first? Jesus first. The moment you seek his kingdom and his righteousness All of these other things will be added to you as well. And I love that Jesus calls them, now these things. Like, when I hear these things, I think about the things in the garage that you want to sell at a yard sale that you're never going to have, and nobody's ever going to buy, by the way. Actually, they are going to buy them, and then they're going to become somebody else's problem. But here's the deal. These things, it just feels so disposable. 
But when we hear about these things that Jesus is talking about, you're going to recognize something. They are disposable. They're disposable, but they feel so important. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go to God's word and find out how these things can take their place under first place of Jesus, his righteousness, and his kingdom. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, today we want to thank you for your word, and we ask you, Lord Jesus, to illuminate your word to us today. God, we pray that your gospel message is proclaimed and preached, uh, and that, Lord, people would respond, that our hearts would be open, that our eyes would be open, our ears attentive, and, Lord Jesus, today that your spirit would accomplish every single thing that it wants to accomplish. Father, I would go so far to say if there's anything inside of us that is standing in the way of your spirit accomplishing all that it is supposed to accomplish, Lord, that 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 spirit of distraction would go in the name of Jesus. God, we want to hear from your word today, and so we ask that your spirit would speak to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, Amen. amen. Hey, before you're seated, give someone a high five or a hug and tell them you're glad they're at church. Our main idea this morning, if you're taking notes, I'd ask you to write it down. If you're joining us online, you can take notes right alongside of us on our app. Uh, It's our our main idea that we're going to unpack. It's the main idea of what I believe Matthew chapter 6 is trying to unpack, and that is that we are to bear the burden of his kingdom. Bear the burden of his kingdom. I'll say it one more time. Bear the burden of his kingdom kingdom. This is what we're going to learn to do today as we unpack Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 33. That's my goal. Chances are probably not, but we'll try really hard, okay? So beginning with Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Remember, Jesus is now about halfway through the Sermon on the Mount, and the crowd has gathered, and others have joined, and I don't re- want to go too far into this, but remember there's three groups of people in the crowd. You remember that? Uh, the first group is the curious, those who are just interested in figuring out what this Jesus thing is all about, what his kingdom thing is all about. Second are the religious, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, may or may not have been there, but one of them was definitely there. The teachers of the law were listening listening to the words of Jesus, and their job or their hope in listening was they wanted to bring acquisition against Jesus. So they were listening intently with the hope of trying to um, build a case. They were case building against Jesus. And so they're, they're listening intently, writing down, and he is uh, offending every religious bone in their body. And I love it because he's good. <laughs> Anyways, okay. and, and the third group were the disciples, right? The disciples were there. And this isn't the original 12 disciples. They hadn't been called yet. Uh, we know for sure there's at least three, but then there are others in the crowd who had decided to follow Jesus that are listening, and Jesus is telling this crowd of people what it means to be agents of the kingdom of God on earth, those who dwell on earth, but whose residence is in heaven. And he tells them in this Sermon on the Mount what it's like, and he continues that conversation in Matthew 6, verse 25, and he says these words, therefore I tell you, and just want to, just brief pop quiz, Who's doing the telling in this moment? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is almost always the answer. You can say it. And everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. I know it's snowing outside and it's warm in here, but you got to wake up with me, people. Okay. Who's doing the telling? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. It's just like Sunday school. Jesus is the answer. He's always the answer. <laughs> Anyways, okay. <laughs> Therefore, I tell you. And remember what I said, it's not, it, it's not applicable to any of you guys. So just, so just listen and pretend like it means something to you. But uh, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your what? You guys don't, I mean, listen, Jesus tells us what? Not to what? Like Jesus, who, who tells us not to worry? And since Jesus tells us not to worry, we are all in this room followers of every stroke of the pen that Jesus did, right? Like, so when Jesus said, don't worry, this isn't something you guys are even thinking about because nobody in this room struggles with worry. Am I right on that? No. (laughs) 
Yeah, no. The reality is, according to a study that I read on the airplane, uh, almost, almost half of the United States find themselves not just struggling with, but consumed with worry. Not just struggling with, consumed with worry. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 6, verse 25, part A, therefore I tell you, Jesus tells you, do not worry about your life. The reality is we worry, don't we, church? We worry about finances. We worry about our kids. We worry about the weather. We worry about how we're going to uh, get uh, what's going to happen on our favorite TV shows. We worry about our sports teams, and you should if you're a Seahawks fan. We worry. I mean, no, you shouldn't because that stuff doesn't matter. But like the reality is we worry. We are, like the reality is, if you were to take one word to describe Western American culture, what you would say was probably worry. We are worried. We're worried about things that don't even matter. But guess what? What do we call things that Jesus tells us not to do? What do we call those things? We call them sin. What do we call them? When Jesus tells us not to do something, what he's telling us not to do is Sin. It's sin. And you know, it's so funny. Like, on all of the things that we don't struggle with, we call all of those sins. Like, and we have this long list of things that are sinful, right? Like, playing cards, that's gambling, therefore it's sin. (laughs) Harry Potter, that's a sin. (laughs) You know, like, uh, dancing, well, that's a sin. I don't care if David did it or not. He was probably sinning. Because these are things. But here's the deal. Can I tell you something? The Bible does not talk about playing cards, Harry Potter, or dancing as a sin. It doesn't. And don't give me this. Well, I'll show you where. Don't waste your time. Be very clear on what Jesus is very clear about. And he's very clear that worry is a sin. Worry is a sin. How do I know that? Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not what? Worry. And so we have this issue, right, that we worry and worry is a sin. And you might be saying, well, Mike, why is worry such a sin? Worry is such a sin because worry deals with the heart. It deals with the heart posture. It deals with this word that you have to learn if you want to follow Jesus. And that word is trust. Worry deals with who is actually Lord of your life. Worry deals with who actually has control of your life. Do you know that you could go to a dance and still be a Christian, but you can't have something control your life like worry and still be a Christian? Uh Uh-oh. It got quiet in here, church. (laughs) Because worry deals with the heart. There's a story about Martin Luther's wife, and if you don't know who Martin Luther is, Martin Luther was the re- leader of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, he found 99, 95 theses on a wall of the Catholic Church that led to the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, but there was a time in Martin Luther's life where he struggled, and there's a story about his wife that I want to read with you. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, went through some pretty uh, serious season of depression. The Pope was out to kill him. His friends disowned him. His cause was languishing. He sunk pretty low and became extremely discouraged. One day he came downstairs to find his wife dressed all in black. She put on her funeral clothes and he asked her, who died now? She said, God did. He was so angry. Now his position has not just created discord among the the church, but now his own wife has become an unbeliever. He asked her, who convinced her of such a lie? She answered, you did. By the way, you're acting. Worry, fear, discouragement, depression. I assume that God must have died. (laughs) I assume that God must have died. You see, the reality is worry is rooted in lies. Lies that God won't do what he said he'll do and won't be who he said he would be. And the moment that we give our hearts over to worry, what we are doing is proclaiming a new Lord over our life. As if worry was going to fix the problem. I love the way the playwright and novelist William Inge says, worthy is interest paid on trouble before it's due. 
Worry is interest paid on trouble before it's due. We are worried about things we have no control over, and we allow our heart to be so consumed by those things that we stay stuck. And what I want to share with you is that as we learn to bear the burden of the kingdom, one of the things that we're going to have to shed is the burden of worry. And I want you to write that down. Bear the burden of the kingdom, not the burden of worry. I want to share with you that worry is all about power and authority. Worry is about power and authority. Some of us, not with our mouths, but by the way we live our lives, we have actually denied the power and authority of Jesus because we've given our heart over to worry. Church, I want to share with you something. Fear and faith are mutually exclusive. Let me just say that again because I don't think you heard me. Fear and faith are mutually exclusive. When you have faith, it casts out fear. And what we do so often when fear and faith rise up, or when fear rises up, is we try to bring fear to our faith. We say, Lord, this is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid. And then you fill in the blanks. And by the way, some of them are very real things. Some of the things that we're afraid of are very real things. But can I share with you, we're doing it backwards. We're bringing our fears to our faith rather than bringing our faith to our fears. We're dwelling in fear and introducing it to our faith rather than dwelling in faith and casting out all fear. You know, I've heard it said so many times, and you've probably heard this before, but oftentimes what we want to do is tell God how big our fears are rather than telling fear how big our God is. And what I want to do today with all of the things that we are worried and spinning and struggling with and the fears and anxieties that are so pressing, I want to introduce them to somebody today. I want to introduce them to the power and presence of the kingdom of God. I want to introduce them to the one who I believe is actually supreme, and his name is Jesus. I want you to lay down your master of fear, money, and provision, and fear of health and wellness. I want you to lay it down in the hands of the only one who can control that, and that is Jesus. And Jesus goes on in this talk, and so far I know I'm not talking to any of you in the room today. I can tell by the looks on your faces. You're just like, well, I'm glad I came for somebody else today. But Jesus goes on to make this point about not worrying. Did you see what he he said not to worry about? Your life. (laughs) I mean, like, he doesn't even break it into sections. He just said the whole thing. Just don't worry about it. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. And to make this point even further, Jesus gives the most crazy example of all time, and I can't wait to share with you. Matthew 6, 25 through 27, we'll get through all of this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about what? Say it again. What you eat or what you drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food? Is not your body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And here's a question, beloved. Can anyone of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Jesus is good, isn't he? I mean, this is good. Like, this is one of those texts I was talking with Pastor Cam this week. It was like one of those things. I should just read it and say, yeah, do that. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's so good. Can anybody add even a single hour to your life? We'll get to that in a second. Um, just curious, what, what animal does Jesus use to describe not to worry? Birds. Of, of all the things in the world to describe, birds. Like, Birds. And, okay, I, listen, if there are any of you in this room that are just like, I love birds. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm not a fan. I, I'm just not. Like, listen, I love eagles. I love eagles. I think they're incredibly beautiful. I'm not a Seahawk fan at all. But, <laughs> but birds. Like, he could have used something, like, more exotic. Like, but he uses Birds. Like, they're, they're, they're birds. Like, they're, they're everywhere. They're not even, like, that unique. 
They're everywhere. There's, there's birds everywhere. It doesn't matter what continent you're on, what country you're in, poor, rich, hot, cold, birds. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're everywhere, these birds are. They fly, they make noise, and they poop. That's the purpose of their life is to ruin the car wash you just got. <laughs> birds. My point is that Jesus picked the most, un, the most common animal he could to teach a principle. He doesn't talk about lions and tigers and bears. I knew one person would do it. He uses the most common of any animal, birds. And he teaches us this most important spiritual truth. He says, look around you. There are birds everywhere. And they're not stressing out. Like, when I read this this week, I'm like, Oh, sure, because they have bird brains. <laughs> like these, these, these simple creatures, they're not stressed out. They're not stressing out. They're just flying around. They somehow every day eat. They somehow every day live, breathe, exist. And guess what? They're birds. They have no savings plans. They don't rent storage sheds. No worms in their IRA. <laughs> this is good. Uh, uh, this is really good. But you know what? They seem to do okay, don't they? Don't they seem to do okay? They seem to be all right except for when they fly into your window. <laughs> How does this happen, church, is my question. How does this happen? Well, according to verse 26, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They do not reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I want to draw your attention to a word of this really quick. It's, uh, it's the second to last word in that, and I want everybody to say it out loud. It's not a, it's not a trick. It's, it starts with a Y, ends with an R, has an O and a U. <laughs> what, what word is it? R. It's interesting. Jesus is talking about birds, and he doesn't say their heavenly Father takes care of them. What does he say? It's, it's really interesting. These birds that aren't worried or concerned about anything, they seem to have what they need to thrive in life and sing and wake you up and poop and stuff. Like they, they seem to have all that they need. Uh, and the reason why they have everything that they need is because your father takes care of them. And if your father takes care of this most common creature, how much greater will your father take care of you. And why is it that we can trust Jesus to take care of birds, which I know the Lord. He doesn't care about birds. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> he cares about people. And what you need to do is once again remember that you are the crown jewel of his creation. And he is your heavenly father. And if your heavenly father takes care of the birds in the air, he'll take care of you too. The first principle in this passage is that you just got to remember that you don't have to bear the burden. You don't have to bear the burden of consumption in your life. You don't have to bear the burden of consumption. Your heavenly father who takes care of the birds in the sky will take care of you. I want to encourage you to bear the burden of his kingdom, not the burden of consumption. And as I read this this week, I was thinking through some things and I just couldn't get away from this principle. First, I wanted to share with you about birds because you could tell how much of a bird fan I am. But then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this area of consumption as I read this this week, I began to think through the implications of the people that were right in front of him. Remember, we go to the original audience first, and some of these people were poor, and so consumption was something that they actually did worry about. Am I going to have the food and drink necessary to exist? But I know the Lord well enough, and I know his word well enough to know that he wasn't only talking to those who were impoverished. What does this mean to us here today, right now? where we have 4 million calories of donuts right on the other side of this door. What does this mean to us here and now? It means that consumption can become an idol worship. Consumption can become idol worship. 
In some of us, consumption has taken over our life. We build our attitudes, our days, and our lives around what we consume. And for some of us, that's food. And I will share with you completely vulnerably right now, for much of my life, I have struggled with food addiction. I have. And I've realized, like, and you could ask my wife, and some of it's funny, sometimes it's not. I was four years old going to the grocery store. My mom says, what store do you want to go to? And I said, I, and I, said, I don't really care. And she goes, well, we're going to go to um, Albertsons. And I said, I said, mom, they don't have good food there. Like, at four years old, I, did, I would choose whether or not I wanted to go somewhere based off what food was there. And then it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. It's just become this crutch for my life when things get tough. I'm an emotional eater, and we write that off as it's funny, right? Like, well, I just turn to the ice cream tub when life gets tough. The reality is the ice cream tub has become your God. The food has become your crutch. And what Jesus is saying, don't worry about food. Do not allow it to be your crutch. I want to be Lord of all. And for some of us, that's food. And I want to challenge you. If that's food in your life, you realize that like you just can't seem to get over this health goal or this thing. You just keep turning back to the fork. I want to challenge you. Don't let food be Lord of your life. What you consume will consume you. Feast upon the word of the Lord and trust him to make up the difference. And for some of us, it's food. But for others of us, it's drink. Beloved of God, some of us, we, we choose whether or not we're going to go hang out with certain people based off what is going to be served by beverage. We, we have decided that unless they're going to be serving an alcoholic drink, I don't want to be around it because the reality is alcohol has become what drives you to want to be around people. And I want to share with you the moment that what you consume consumes you, it becomes sin. Sin. And for some of us in the room right now, your alcohol use has become sin. I'm not saying all alcohol use is sin. Don't hear me say that. I'm not that legalistic. But I will share with you, some of us, the drinking has gotten out of line. The Bible says, seek first his kingdom. It doesn't say seek first what wine they're serving. Seek first what drinks they're going to be making. If the first question out of your mouth is, what kind of beverages are we going to be drinking, chances are you have a problem. And I want to invite you into freedom in Jesus Christ that comes when we put him first. Listen, there's no judgment in this room. I'm not here to try to be like, well, you better stop all the drinking. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to introduce your struggle to my Jesus. Your insecurity and your brokenness to faith in a God that loves you, believes in you, no matter what the issue and struggle you might face. I want to encourage you to just lay down that consumption idol before the Lord. Stop bearing the burden of how you're going to eat and drink and trust him as Lord over all. Life ought to revolve around what produces righteousness. I want to just say that again. Life ought to revolve around what produces righteousness. And what you eat and what you drink doesn't produce righteousness. Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And as if birds weren't crazy enough, Jesus takes it up a whole nother level. Just track with me. I love this message. Matthew 6, 28 through 30. And do not worry about your what? Everybody say close. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? <laughs> just, just again, just, ah! <laughs> he throws in that you of little faith. Like, okay, birds are one thing, but grass? <laughs> I mean, grass. I mean, it, it's pretty pathetic, if I'm honest with you, church. At this point, Jesus is using Birds and grass to school us on theology and spirituality. He's using birds and grass to tell us that 
we ought to do what they do, essentially. Because birds and grass remember things that we don't remember. Birds and grass remember who's in control. All of creation is proclaiming the glory of the Lord. And birds and grass aren't stressed. Grass is not stressed about turning green. Birds are not stressed about doing whatever birds do. Here's the reality. Birds and grass know that they're cared for. Why do we forget? Why do we forget that our reality is crown jewel of creation. So what do we do, Mike, with all of the anxieties and fears? What do we do with all that? We do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. We cast all of our cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. He cares for us more than he cares for the grass in the field, the pansies in the field, more than he cares for the birds in the sky. God cares for you, beloved of God. Please hear me right now. A lot of you, when I said that, you're like, yeah, but. (laughs) Yeah, but, Mike, I have all of this dot, dot, dot sin in my life that is going to keep him. I want you to know something. His care and concern, his love for you isn't determined by your behavior. His care and concern and love for you was determined from the foundation of the world when he liked the idea of you so much that he put skin to it. He cares for you. He loves you. He's for you and not against you. And so what I want to share with you is that here's the reality of worry. It's unnecessary. Why is it unnecessary? Because worry doesn't add a single hour to your life. If you were to take this in its original context, it wasn't about adding an hour to your life. It was actually adding size to you. That's what the the original language said. Which one of you by worry could add any cubics to your life or your your, your stature? And trust me, if worrying about height fixed it, I would be 6'8". I had a dream of playing for your Los Angeles Lakers. And instead, the Lord gave me five foot eight. (laughs) And since I'm not Spud Webb or Muggsy Bowes and can't jump very high, I had to find a different career. (laughs) But you know what? Worry doesn't add, it doesn't add feet to your life. It doesn't add longevity to your life. It is unnecessary. Can I share with you more than unnecessary? Worry is unproductive. (laughs) It's unproductive. You can't add anything to your life. By worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to sleep, where you're going to wear, what you're going to do. It doesn't add anything. It's it literally, when you, what you're struggling with is how are you going to provide? And what I read in scripture is that God is my provider. God is my provider. Beloved, make that your own declaration. God is my provider. I don't have to bear the burden of provision for my family because God loves my family more than I do. Now, do I have a part? Somebody say yes. Yeah, I got to say yes to the Lord for what he tells me to do. And as I say yes to the Lord, I trust him for the provision of all things necessary for life and godliness for my family. And I want to invite you into that same reality. Therefore, do not worry. Do not worry. Don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear. Verse 32 For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What's the next word? It starts with the letter B. Say it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you as well. Beloved, I would share with you today, it comes down to a choice. It comes down to a choice. That word but shows me that there is another way. I love the conjunctions in scripture. These words that are so packed, filled with life. The, the, the other side of that conjunction is don't worry, but. What it means is that he is going to tell you how not to worry. Don't worry, but seek first. It's the question of position that leads us to not worry. When we are seeking first our kingdom, we will worry. But when we make the kingdom of Jesus the sole proprietor of our lives, when we grant God not just Salvation or, or savior status, but lordship status of our lives. 
Beloved, here's what I'm inviting you into right now. Make him Lord of your life. Give him full control, rule and reign. It already belongs to him anyways. <laughs> and allow the Lord of all to be all you need for all things necessary for life and godliness. Amen.